Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm excited to see you all here today. Uh, we did still have the drive-up service despite the rain, and it was a good turnout for the rain. Um, we, I did it from my car, so I did not get soaked. As you can see, I stayed dry, and um, but it was good this morning, and I'm excited for you to experience church now at 1030 as well. Um, as far as announcements, the, um, I'll go ahead and just continue uh, with the announcement of July 12th will be uh, mine and Chloe's wedding shower, um, and it's come and go, and it will be at the church annex. Um, other than that, uh, we'll continue to have services in here as uh, long as we're allowed to. Um, I suspect it'll be for the rest of the summer, um, but or at least until the rest of the summer. But we're still going to follow with the, whatever the government tells us. Um, and we're going to keep the social distancing for quite some time. So I thank you all for wearing your mask. And um, we'll go ahead and open up in prayer. Um, know that in your bulletins, um, I laid them out in the pews. And you might have grabbed some on your way in. But we printed out the hymns for you. So it's directly out of the hymn book, so it looks very, very familiar if you use the hymn book. Um, but these are the just the songs that we're going to sing for today. So we didn't print off the entire hymn book for you. So it's just with your songs. Yeah. Yes. Cool. That's awesome. Um, her cousin's... Well, my first cousin's great. He's old first, but Nancy outlived him, and she's 10 years younger than me. She's on the small program, she remember. She has a lot of other friends, but the last couple of times, but she outlived him. She's cancer free. Yeah, she's cancer free. So, yeah. Um, Jessica Lee's cousin, Jessica Lee, she's about 10 years younger than me. She's a little bit older than me. She's about 10 years younger than me. All right. Uh, we'll go ahead and open up in prayer, and then we'll start doing a little bit of singing and a little bit of preaching, me, and then uh, a little bit more singing. So, do you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father and gracious God, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for these moments that we get to spend um, at Shady Grove General Baptist Church inside the building. Lord, we're excited for what you're going to do today and what you're going to do through the years to come. And I ask in this moment that you open up the hearts of everyone that's in this building, that they hear your message for them today, whether it be through the music or through the sermon. Lord, we, or I ask that you open up our hearts and that we receive your word today and that we leave blessed and refreshed to take on the week. For us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. First song this morning, let's all stand. It's Jesus Hold My Hand. So if you open up your insert, it's on the inside. It's one of those that spans two pages.
going to use a song today if I can help somebody as we make our journey from day to day over a period of time we meet a lot of people we live we speak we testify but it's in the journey that makes the difference being faithful true to God true to your family and loving each other if I can help somebody today that's what I'm going to sing Turn to Ezra chapter 4 if you brought your Bible today. Once again, uh, thank you all for coming and wearing your mask. Um, it's um, heartwarming because I know there's a lot of churches that struggle with their church members not wanting to abide by the rules um, that we put forth. And um, I'm thankful that I'm a part of a church now that's willing to keep each other safe um, if it means a little bit of discomfort for just a few minutes. Um, but we're, we're going to look at Ezra chapter 4. I should probably turn in my Bible. That would be helpful. Um, 
And then I'll be reading out of the NIV. It says, When the enemies of Judah and Benjamin heard that the exiles were building a temple for the Lord, the God of Israel, they came to Zerubbabel and to the heads of the families and said, Let us help you build, because, like you, we seek your God and have been sacrificing to him since the time of Ershadon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. But Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the rest of the heads of the family answered, You have no part with us in building a temple for our Lord. We alone will build it for the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, commanded us. Then the peoples around them set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building. They bribed officials to work against them and frustrate their plans during the entire reign of King Cyrus of Persia and down to the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father and gracious God, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to come together as a church family once again in the building and just worship you and love you and listen to the message that you have for us today. I ask that you open up our hearts to receive the message that you've prepared through me and that you speak through me as you only know how and that you translate my words into their heart for the message that you need them to hear. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So can you hand me a tissue? I think my nose is bleeding. It's not uncommon that my nose bleeds, so don't don't freak out. Yeah. Here, this is gonna be a weird preaching. <laughs> Second week. Now, first week I had this on and I took it off. Second week I had tissue up my nose. Starting this off strong. <laughs> Everyone's gonna talk about. Yeah, we hired a twenty-one-year-old. At least I was not like sticking my finger on my nose. That would have been worse. So, as we're, this is so weird. I've never preached with tissue on my nose. <laughs> nope, it's still bleeding. Okay. Um, so, we start off and we read Ezra chapter 4. And this is actually before what we talked about last week. So the book of Haggai uh, comes 16 years after this moment that we find in Ezra chapter 4. And we find that this is almost right when they get back. So they're back, they're starting to rebuild. The surrounding communities and countries are hearing about their rebuilding and have heard that King Cyrus of Persia has allowed them to come back. And since they're enemies, it doesn't really make them happy about it. You see, they, they hear about this, and they remembered the hatred that they received from Israel in past years. They remembered uh, the opposition that they got from Israel, and they hated them. So they wanted to come in and disrupt what was happening. They didn't want them to rebuild. They liked life better under the Babylonians. They liked life better without Israel. So what they do is they're like, how about we just try and manipulate our way into the situation? So they, they have this argument. They're like, well, we have been worshiping your God since the Assyrians, the, the last king of the Assyrians. So it's been a long time. This is before the 70 years. We've been worshiping your God, and we just want some part in rebuilding. We want to help you. We want to give you some resources. We want to give you some of our workers so that you can rebuild and rebuild faster. And from the outside, that would seem like a, a great plan because you're only coming back with about a third of all of Israel because of the three different journeys. This is still in the first one. And um, your the first initial thought would be, well, yeah, you can help us. You've been worshiping our God. You, you're a Christian. You know, you can come and help. And or at least 
least you claim that you're a Christian, but behind all of that, they never said that they exclusively worshiped God. You see, many of these enemies of Judah and Benjamin were enemies of God. And they, were, they may have worshipped God, but they also worshipped other gods. They worshipped fake and um, pagan gods. They worshipped idols. And this is all things that Israel has done in their past that got them to the situation that they were in for 70 years. And they know this. And Zerubbabel knows this. So when they hear this offer coming from their enemies, first off, they're kind of weirded out by it. They're kind of like, well, I mean, you just, you're, you're our enemies. Why would you want to help us now, now that we're coming back? And so Zerubbabel doesn't make the decision by himself. He goes and asks Joshua, the high priest. He gathers up the heads of all the families. So the 12 tribes of Israel, he's gathering all those families up. He's like, here's what the offer is from our enemies. And I don't want to do it. So that's exactly what they do. They talk about it. They find the, the manipulation that's happening. And they say, we're not going to let you rebuild. We're going to rebuild it by ourselves. And that's the way it's going to be. So the next step for the enemies, since he couldn't make his way into the building to have some type of influence, because likely if they would have said okay, they would have had political control uh, because they invested resources and time and people into that. So they would have some type of control over them and how it was run and very well would have brought in pagan gods and idol worship, which would have led them back into potentially another exile. And they would have been right back in the position that they were, and maybe even worse because they made the same mistake twice. So they didn't want to make that same mistake. So I'm going to check. Quick check. I think we're good. So they go. And they tell him, no, we're not going to let you help us rebuild. We don't want any of your pagan gods. We don't want your idols in there. We want to faithfully follow God and faithfully have only him in the building. So the enemies are like, well, since we can't get in that way, we're just going to discourage them and threaten them. You see, the threat was real for Israel because they hadn't built their walls yet their defensive walls. And back in that day, um, all, of the, all of the cities had walls around the city. Not, not just the country, but they had it around the city. And what that represented was that that was theirs. Everyone in there belonged there. That they couldn't leave or they couldn't come in, which they could, but to go and travel different places within the country. But it was the idea of, I live here, and it was also an idea and symbolism of security because um, it would be hard to break down the walls to come in and it would be hard for enemies to come in and they would have guards on top of the walls that could see the enemies come before they make it there and they could defend it that way too but they didn't have walls because everything was destroyed uh, previously by the babylonians so they start threatening them, knowing that they don't have a, a line of defense, knowing that that alone would scare them, and it did. And that was some of the fear that we talked about last week. This was like the second part of the fear. It wasn't only just the fear of the new, the fear of the future. It was the fear of this real threat that was happening to them, and that threat was opposition. And... They not only did that, but they bribed officials within the temple to go and frustrate the plans. So how I imagine this, it doesn't really clearly say in the Bible how this worked, but I imagine that they had, that they paid um, officials, uh, whether it be governmental officials or even people that were working on the temple, to just be like, do you really think that this is going to work? Do you really think? that this is going to bring as much glory as Solomon's temple once did? 
which started to make them feel discouraged about rebuilding. And then that led them to the 16 year period where they stopped and they didn't do anything. They did their own home improvement. They were going down to Lowe's and not really, but you know, they're going down to Lowe's and Home Depot and getting um, everything ready for their own home so that they could rebuild their own homes. But they stopped worrying about the church. They stopped worrying about the temple and they did that for 16 years. And that's why God sent Haggai and Zechariah to encourage them to rebuild, in which they did rebuild. But when I see this, uh, as we're talking about going home, as we're studying this story uh, of the Israelites coming back home, I remember that Ecclesiastes says that there's nothing new under the sun. So where the Israelites faced opposition, so will we when we begin to rebuild. Because the community is going to hear about it, surrounding cities, maybe even surrounding churches are going to hear about what's happening at Shady Grove General Baptist Church. And they will begin to oppose what we're doing, which is sharing the gospel, which is faithfully following God. And the reason for that is because people are comfortable in their own darkness. Because it's in the darkness that they can hide their guilt and their shame and their sin and when we start rebuilding we will be a beacon of light into their lives we may not be able to see what is wrong with them because they hide it so well but that doesn't mean that they won't be able to see them you see when you're in the dark and you're in a very dark room you look down and you can't see yourself i remember going to like Marengo Cave on a school field trip or something. They turned out the lights when we were in the deepest part. And they said, put out your hand in front of you. And you couldn't see anything. But when we start rebuilding, it will be like turning the lights on. And it will be shining into people's lives. And they will be able to see their own shame and their own guilt. And they have really just two options, two responses. They accept it or they oppose it. So I think as a church, I want to prepare you and prepare this church to face opposition when it comes. There's no if, it will come. And we see that in the world today. So how do we face it? Well, I found two things when reading Ezra, uh, reading this section and then uh, the rest of chapter 4, which goes on to um, go to the two kings that were in between Cyrus and Darius. So this was several years um, between when they were starting to rebuild again, uh, 16. And the first one that I saw was that they stood as one. The Israelites, they stood as one. And I find that from when Zerubbabel called up Joshua and the heads of the family to make the decision together. It wasn't just Zerubbabel. It was all of them that made this decision, and they stood on what they believed in. They stood on their past mistakes and not wanting to make those mistakes again. They stood on the foundation of God. They stood united as a church. And what that looks like today is that we encourage each other. We constantly build each other up. We love each other, and we pray for each other often. Not just the church but the individuals in the church. See, they stood as one. They faced opposition together, not alone. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12, just as a body, though one, has many parts, but all of its many parts form one body, so it was with Christ. You see, we're, as the church, the body of Christ. All of us have a different purpose for this church in this room, but we're all going the same direction because we're standing as one. We're not standing as 80 individuals or however many, um, however many individuals that gathered um, at the drive up and here. We're not standing separately. We're all in this together. We're going the same direction. You see my, my hand functions differently, does different things than my foot does. I, I don't write out my papers with my foot. I'm not that talented. But the foot has a purpose because it leads where we're going. 
and the hands, they just naturally, when you walk, they move at your sides. You see, all of it flows together unless you just absolutely think about it. You're like, I'm not moving my hands when I walk now. Now the next time that you walk, you're going to be like, oh, they do do that. You see, it, it all flows together. You can ask Chloe about all of the different functions of the body because she's studying to be a nurse and like how all of it just works together. And that's how the church should be, that we're all continuously flowing. We're all, we all have different functions. We all have different ministries within the church, but we're all going the same direction and we're standing in the face of opposition, not just as a hand, not just as a rib, not just as a knee or kneecap. We're standing together. We're all coming together, being like, this is how we're going to face opposition. So now that we have the mindset of how to face opposition, which is together, then we go into two specifics of how we're going to face opposition when it comes. The first one is have faith. We're going to have faith in God to take care of it. Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, it says, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Now, I'm sure you've heard, if you've ever heard that or heard a sermon preached on it, that the mustard seed grows into one of the largest bushes on the planet to where sometimes they're referred to as trees because of their size. But it takes time for it to grow. It, it doesn't grow immediately. It takes years to grow to the size, to its full potential. And that means to me that the small faith that we start off with, that mustard seed faith, can grow into something greater than we ever imagined. A faith where we're more than conquerors. A faith that fully relies on God, not just for some of the things, but for everything. That a faith that can move mountains. A faith that embraces the mystery I heard a sermon by T.D. Jakes a while back, and he talked about how faith is a mystery because we don't know the outcome until it happens. If we didn't have faith, or if we wouldn't have faith, if we knew everything that was going to happen, if we had all the answers that we ever desired, we would never have to have faith because we would already know. So faith, it's a faith that embraces mystery and is always moving forward and trusting in God to move the mountains for us and not all of us pushing on the mountain hoping that it moves. It's a faith that changes full Kentucky and it's a faith that's going to change the world. But it takes time. It takes time to grow a faith like that. It's like sometimes it takes time to move mountains but it doesn't mean that they're not going to move. It doesn't mean that it's not going to grow when we don't immediately see results, especially living in this day and age where I am a loyal Amazon Prime member. <laughs> I love having my packages at my doorstep in two days, sometimes one day, sometimes the same day. <laughs> but it takes time. It's going to take some patience, too. It takes time to grow, but it doesn't mean that we're not going to get there. It just means that we got to be patient and go through the process and enjoy the process. Lastly, I think to face opposition, and this may be the most important thing that we could ever do as a church and as individuals in the church, as individual body parts of the church, as we're standing as one, as we're having faith together, is to love God and love others. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 3. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy that can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, 
And if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. You see, it doesn't matter how big or how small the mountain of opposition that we face. It doesn't matter how big that is if we move it with our faith. If we don't love, moving that mountain means nothing. The, the purpose of this church means nothing. If we don't have love, facing and overcoming the opposition means nothing. Anything that this body of the church will do in this community if we don't love, if we don't do it lovingly, if we don't have love in our hearts, all of it's just going to go to waste. And I don't want to see that in this church. I thought of this illustration uh, going with the mustard seed faith. We have the mustard seed. And with that faith, we plant it in the ground. And when we plant it in the ground, we plant it in good soil, which is love. Because love will give the nutrients that enhances the growth of our faith. And then Jesus and the Holy Spirit and the gospel message is what flows through us, which is the water. Because water represents life. So Jesus is our life. So as he's flowing through us, if we're not loving, we're never going to grow. Because if you've ever done any type of gardening, if you don't have good soil, if you put it in a and a big thing of rocks with no soil, it doesn't matter how much water you put into it, it's not going to grow. It's going to die. So as a church, I'm challenging you because it's hard. It's easier said than done. When you look at Matthew 17, Jesus says that they don't have any faith, that they don't even have faith the size of a mustard seed. So it's hard to get to that mustard seed faith. But I want us as Shady Grove, as united as one, as the body of Christ, to have the mustard seed faith that's nourished by love. But that means that we're going to have to love God, which means that we're going to have to trust Him to take control of things that we want to control. That we're going to have to trust Him in the mystery where we don't know the direction that this church is going to go but yet we still trust him and we love him to do it but also some of the best ways that you can show god that you love him is that you love his creation and that you love each other not only in this church but out in the community because there's all people that are really hard to love and i'm sure immediately most of you thought of that one person or those people that are really hard to love. But you're going to have to love them. Even when they oppose you, even the enemies that we face, the Bible tells us to love our enemies. So we're supposed to saturate Poole and Dixon and Seabury and Cairo and all of these cities. As far as we can reach, we're supposed to saturate them with love. And I think that's what's going to grow this church. I think that's what's going to change the community that we're in. And that's what's going to make this church have more than a mustard seed faith. It's because we're constantly putting that and pouring that into our lives. It's going to be hard work. If you remember last week, it's, it's going to be hard. But if we dedicate ourselves and we don't make the same mistake and we don't stop rebuilding for 16 years, like the Israelites did. I think God's going to show us some amazing things that we never imagined were possible in Poole, Kentucky. I truly believe that the church, that this church, will move mountains. We'll move mountains of opposition. We'll move mountains of doubt. We'll move mountains of hardships. Not only for this church, but we'll move mountains in other people's lives. They'll see us in the faith that we have. And when they encounter us, everyone faces mountains. They're going to see their mountain ahead of us. They'll be like, that's never going to move. That's never going to change. But we have that faith and we have that love. And it saturates and it pours into their life that we move their mountains too. We don't just move mountains of opposition that are coming into the church. We move 
the opposition of other people. This church will move mountains. Mountains that you thought were impossible to move. And there will be opposition because people, sometimes people don't want those mountains to be moved. They want to keep those mountains where they are because they love the beauty of seeing the mountain. But they don't realize the beauty behind the mountain that they've been missing out for all these years. But when people don't want those mountains to be moved and they begin to be moved, I want us to be prepared as a church to face that opposition by standing together as one, by having faith, and loving God, and loving others. Would you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father and gracious God, Lord, I thank you again for this moment. I ask that you continue to speak through them, speak to them this week as we go our separate ways that you have challenged them today, whatever message you laid on their heart through the words that I spoke. Lord, I ask that you just be with them this week, that we continue to rebuild, even in the face of opposition, even when we face that, that we stand together. Lord, I ask that we continue to have faith, not just the faith of a mustard seed, but a faith of a mustard seed that grows. Lord, I pray that you give us the strength and the courage and the boldness to love you and love others. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Drop your tithes and offerings into that plate. 
or a bucket. I think there's a five gallon bucket over on that side. Uh, so drop your tithes and offerings into that. And uh, Papa, will you dismiss us in prayer? Sure. Father, thank you for today for the many blessings you have given us. And Father, we are thankful that uh, sending Logan our way and be with him, put your arms around him and be with the ones that are sick and in the hospital and the rest homes and uh, comfort him, give him a good day and be with all the members of the church. Lord, I know this is a trying time for everybody, but we'll get through this. And so forgive us all of our sins, please. Thanks for asking, Donnie. Amen. Amen. Amen.